All right, everybody, welcome back. What, uh, it, quick show of hands, who enjoyed the morning session? Well, you know, I have to say that each session just gets better and better. So, uh, you know, I'm glad you're here. I look forward to this afternoon. Uh, I want to take a quick thank you once again to all our sponsors that really made this awesome event possible, uh, especially our presenting sponsor, Hancock Whitney. Uh, now, Easy Company, as you gather, has many le legacies. Uh, in this next session, a company of heroes, the legacy of Easy Company, We'll explore the memory of the Band of Brothers, uh, formed by the book and the miniseries, including the bonds uh, the veterans formed with the actors who portrayed them. As many of you now uh, recognize, you know, family members of Easy Company veterans also carry on the spirit of camaraderie, education about their loved ones and their legacies. So today we have an amazing opportunity to hear cast members and veteran family members share deep and personal insights into the men of Easy Company. So once again, uh, we're going to go to the well, as we say, and we'll turn to our uh, veteran and talented moderator, Kirk Sadusky of Playtone. And uh, Kirk, with that, uh, continue mission. Thank you, Doctor. As Dr. Bell said, this is about the legacy of Easy Company. And of course, all of this, this whole, this whole weekend, is it the legacy of, of Easy Company. Uh, we do have the the children and of of some of the members of Easy Company, as well as the actors that portrayed their father. We also have on stage Jody Burke, who uh, some of you may have met yesterday, um, who is one of the producers of the We Stand Alone Together, which is the documentary that we made as a companion. And I will say that Jody, maybe more than any of us, got to know more of the men. In a, in, a, in a deeper way because she interviewed them over probably a year and a half maybe? Three over, th thank you, twice that long, three years. So she knows them very well. So I'm gonna, we're gonna talk, we're gonna have her tell you some of her insights and some of the men. Um, I think we'll start off by everybody just, in, please introduce yourself. Uh, let's start with the, the son or daughter and then the actor and, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Just, in, ju just introduce yourself, who your father was, and All right. then Is the actor will follow. Are we on? My dad, I'm Gene Guarneri. I'm the son of Wild Bill Guarneri, and I never knew him as Wild Bill until this thing happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Frank John Hughes. I played Wild Bill. I'm Trisha Zavril, and I'm the daughter of Babe Heffron. My name is Robin Ling, and I played Babe Heffron. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carrie Tipper. My dad was Ed Tipper. And the rumor is Tipper actually gave Wild Bill the nickname Wild Bill. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jody. Oh, hi. I'm Jody Burke, uh, one of the producers of We Stand Alone Together, the documentary. My name is Chris Langlois from Baton Rouge. Go Tigers. My grandfather is Doc Rowe. Shane Taylor, Doc Rowe. <laughs> yeah, you go first. My name is George Luz. My dad was George Luz. George, you're already You're here. George Luz Jr. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. You know, you're right there. Thanks for the And question. I'm Ju George Luz Sr. <laughs> That's how it works. It's obvious to me, too, yes. <clears throat> and I don't have any other name. Rick Gomez is my name. So, so as you can tell, there's no camaraderie between the actors and the, and the families. Um, well, let's start with that. And I'm, Frank, I am gonna, I'm going to throw it to you guys first. Talk about, we've, talked, we've touched on it a little, little bit this morning and, and yesterday, but talk about that. There is a unique bond that was established, I know particularly with you and Bill, but tell us how, how, that, how it started. Give, walk us through the process a little bit, please. I, um, I had, I'll say it quick, I may have said it in one of the other panels, but I, I got his number the night before the final audition. I called him, I said, yowza, he answered the phone, and uh, 
just hearing his voice on the phone was so shocking that this, it was this man had, in this book that I had been studying had come to life. And he said, uh, I said, Mr. Garnier, I'm, I'm auditioning to play you tomorrow. Oh, they already got the guy. And he told me that, and then, and then I said, well, if I get it, I'd like to take you to dinner. I got it, I called him back, and that began this, this calling him three, four times a week, talking for five, six hours. He emptied everything um, that he had to give me. Um, he knew that it was, it was going to be out in the world, and if it was going to be out in the world, it should be done right. And uh, the real motivation was just trying to get it right for all the other men. He wanted to talk about everyone else's involvement. And it started this um, incredibly intimate friendship with him because he was telling me things that he hadn't told me. I mean, G Gene had said, he's told you things he hasn't told me. And um, so I knew I was carrying his legacy, that sacrosanct to me. It had to be done the right way. And to get it right, I just had to know him better. And then eventually, we talked for months and months. And then I think episode four or five, when we were doing that, they flew out. And Babe and Bill came to, came to set. And it was Lennon and McCartney showing up. In Liverpool. It, everything stopped. We were talking about in another panel all those sets being built and everything. Every hammer went down. And they just, they just gathered around. And uh, we had this incredible moment with your dad because um, we only introduced each other as our character names. And again, this isn't a war film with stock names. Every one of these names had such a meaning to each one of them. These were their friends who they loved. And I, I introduced um, Richard Spate as Muck. And I said, babe, this is Muck. And he looked at him and he said, damn, kid, I was there when you got it. <laughs> and it was at that moment that we realized we were ghosts. A lot of us were ghosts to them, that these were not just names. They were people they loved and had lost and had lived without for so many years. Um, it really put importance into the uniform you were wearing and what you were representing. You know? And I've seen similar things like we've seen with Grace, with Grace Nixon, with Ron. Um, so uh, that really set the tone. But Bill was just fearless in sharing. I'm glad you brought up Grace uh, Nixon and Ron Livingston. I, I got to know Grace Nixon very well. She was a neighbor back in California. And I know that um, Ron Livingston cultivated a very um, important relationship. He, he, um, we used to take her to baseball games when Ron would come to Dodger games. And you could see that Grace, this unexpected thing happened with Band of Brothers and her husband becoming famous and being played by this, this, this wonderful actor. And I don't want to say she adopted him like a second son. That's too dramatic. But they became very close. And the kind of relationship that you just, you, 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 it, it couldn't have happened in any other way. And they obviously got so much out of each other. I know Ron's, Ron's uh, father, or grandfather, I'm sorry, was on the death march to the Bataan. So he had, he had a special, um, anybody from, the world, from World War II or World War II veteran had a, a special appeal to him. So that, that helped in their bond. So it, even if it's more than just the people you're, you meet here this weekend, it happened company-wide. Company Gene, Frank said that um, he told your dad, Frank said that Bill told your, him stuff that he didn't tell you. Why, why do you think that was? I was his son. He didn't tell me anything. When I went to Vietnam, he said, good luck, kid. <laughs> and when I come home, he said, how you doing? I mean, that was the, he didn't, they didn't talk to you at all. And I'll tell you real quick, I'll tell you, I got a few funny stories about him. And if you talk about Bill and Babe, you have to leave out profanities. And I'm going to do the best I can to do that. <laughs> and anyway, the, when, when my father had a heart attack and he went into the hospital, the doctor asked him, they said, they asked my brother, they said, when did he lose his leg? And you know what my brother's response was? Episode seven. <laughs> <laughs> that's a true story. True story. I mean, not only my father was screwy, but my brother. Then you talk, we talked that Ivan's here, right? Ivan takes my father and babe to Cleveland to go on a morning show. 
Now, he tells, my wife was there, he tells the, this is live. That doesn't mean anything to your dad or my father. So they go on a morning show, and there's two guys, I don't think saw a band of brothers, I, I don't know, it seemed like I saw the, the, uh, the, the shot of it. And the guy's talking, and Babe is talking, yeah, we were going down the road, and there was all kind of krauts there, and this and that, dead. Mm -hmm. And they're talking, so the one guy, after he gets done with Babe, now this is live, and he says to my father, was it cold in Bastogne? My father was colder than a well digger's ass. Yeah. <laughs> uh, security, you know, I mean, this is the, if you invited these two people anywhere, my father got invited everywhere, and everywhere he went, he went to smoke. And a lot of times there was no smoking. So he said, all right, I'm leaving. And then, wait, wait, you could smoke if you really want to. <laughs> but anyway, I'll pass it on. This. I got a few more stories, but I'll, I'll pass it on to somebody else. Thank you. <laughs> we definitely want to hear more of those stories. Um, Can I just say one thing? Yeah, please. G Gene is a member of the 101st in Vietnam. Yeah. So we have another Screaming right. Eagle right, right here. No, thank you, Gene. Thank you. Thank you. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, um, tell us about playing Babe, Babe Afro. Well, first of all, I mean, Frank said he uh, spoke to Bill before his final audition. I was cast quite late, and uh, I'd watched the VCRs, you remember those? The tapes and the audio cassettes, and I had a flavor of him, and I thought, I need to, I, you know, I, sh I should, they said, you can, you can call him. He's happy for you to call him. I said, okay, well, that would be really useful. So I call him, and it rings out. And I think, I'll try the next day. And I call him, and it rings out. And eventually, I say to somebody, I can't, I can't get in touch with Babe. And they say, phone Bill. So I phone Bill. I have a great conversation with Bill, because as soon as he answers the phone, he just starts, you know, the conversation begins. And eventually, I say, oh, by the way, is Babe, is he out of town? And he says, no, no. He says, you just, you know, you're not going to catch him in. He leaves the, home, the house at 7.30 in the morning, and he doesn't come home till night. So you're going to you're gonna have to stay up late or get up early, <laughs> you know? And so eventually I stayed up. Um, I think Bill said, listen, you're going to have to speak to this kid. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I, I finally spoke to him. Um, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning in the UK. And he just got in. And like, as Frank said, he was open. And um, he, he said, anything you need to know, kid, just ask. You know? And he was really, really open and honest. Because um, he knew, yeah, he knew it was happening. And if he wanted it to be um, right, not just about him, but about all the men. If you want the stories to be right, he knew he would have to divulge things that um, were difficult. And it was a, a great privilege to be, to be able to have those conversations with him. Trish, how did your dad feel about all this? He wasn't a, one, he wasn't a man to hide his emotions. <laughs> uh, no. The first thing, the first conversation we had was when he found out that Robin was going to play him in Band of Brothers. And he called me, and he's like, kid, you're not going to believe it. They got a Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> a Scotsman. How's a Scotsman going to do South Philly? <laughs> <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> um, how did he feel about the project? I had a lot of conversations with your dad about the project, and some, and I think he was of mixed emotions sometimes. What, 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 how, did, how did he feel about yes, that? Yeah. Tell us about that. Um, I think he, my dad was a very sensitive person, although I know it's, some of you may not believe that, but if you really got to know him, he was very sensitive. Um, and he fluctuated uh, because he would, he thought it's an important story needs to be told, but on a personal level, it was very, very difficult for them to open up and discuss it. And he had to really 
um, push himself sometimes. And I had some long conversations with him about it. And, and he, he agreed to, you know, he would do it. But um, I think ultimately he was really, really happy that he did it. And why do you think he eventually agreed? Because again, I know he was conflicted. Um, because younger people started stopping him on the street. Um, they had seen Band of Brothers, and he, I think, at, I think once it started, he realized that it was going to have an impact. Maybe not the impact that we ended up with, but he's, and that's when he, um, my Uncle Bill and my dad started going to schools. They started visiting elementary schools and high schools and talking to the kids. And my dad's main message, his most important message, w was the Holocaust. He was at Landisburg and he wanted that message to be, to be shared because he, when someone would say the Holocaust didn't happen, I mean, this tiny, tiny little man would jump out of his chair <laughs> and was ready, you know, as he would say, go to Fist City. Um, <laughs> so, it was an important story to be told. And Trish, he did get in a fight when he was about 85, right? In the bar? True but, story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about the relationship between Bill and Babe. Because it, it, they met later in the war. Babe was a replacement. And yet, how did... They found out that they were from the same neighborhood. And they became brothers. I mean, they became almost literal brothers from that point on. You two, you two, please tell us about the lifelong friendship between Bill and Babe. Well, first of all, Babe didn't drive. That's a great relationship when you got one driver who was my father who had one leg and Babe, <laughs> who, babe who, who didn't drive and had two legs. <laughs> so your father got him a job, remember? I remember my father got a job, the place closed down, my, we were both out of work. But them two, I mean, if you want to talk about Lenny and Squiggy, Bert and Ernie, whatever you want to, they were, they were together. They, I went with places with them, they slept in the same room. We went to, when we went to Paris, we went to Paris. We went to Paris, we stayed at whatever hotel, it was a big hotel in New York. We had two bedrooms, me and my brother had one, Lenny and Squiggy had the other one, right? <laughs> Your father says at the desk, we don't need another room. We'll all stay in the same room. Wait a minute. So me and my brother go in the room. Him and my father are sleeping in the beds. My brother get this thing out. We pulled the box spring out, and it had a tag, 1925. The bid was made. We had to sleep on But that's the way they were. They didn't take anything. They gave. They didn't take anything. And I, I, Ivan was right. Gave $25 bill. Whatever they had, they would give you. They never made any money. They were very poor businessmen. I could tell you that right up front. But they were giving. My father would help anybody, and my father and babe, they really never badmouthed anybody. If they didn't like you, they just didn't talk to you. Am I right, Trish? Yeah, if my dad didn't like you, he wouldn't, um, he, he, he would just, you know, he would just ignore you. Not to, Put a hit on you. Like, he, would, he was never mean about it. He would never, you know, but, yeah. They, didn't, they have no time for you if you weren't, you know, a de what they felt was, a, a, you know, a good person. Thank you. Well, and we're, we're going to come back to, the, to Squiggy and Lenny can't in, wait. In, in, in a bit. Um, tell us about it, Tipper. Um, I mean, how do you sum up 95 years of an extraordinary life? Um, my father, my father's war was, was very short, actually. It was uh, six days, very intense. Um, his the scene that takes him out was portrayed in episode three, Karen Tan. And what is kind of remarkable, I think, about my father, and it, it ties into some of the things we've talked about today, is he came back, uh, he was in army hospitals for about a year before he was discharged, and the only reason he got to go to college was because of the GI Bill, his parents were Irish immigrants, and that transformed his life. He, from there, went on to be a teacher and taught high school for 30 years in Jefferson County, Colorado, which is where, for the most part, I grew up. And everywhere I went with him when I was little, and mind you, he was 61 when I was born, um, so everyone thought he was my grandfather. Um, and my, you know, his life was extraordinary. My mother's from Costa Rica. She's 
this beautiful 35-year-old who he somehow persuaded to marry in nine months, and 10 months later, I came along. Um, this is probably no surprise, but my mom was about four months pregnant before she realized that it was an indigestion that she had. I was a complete shock. And um, I remember in high school, my high school counselor um, describing a moment where my dad was talking to her about me graduating high school, and then he couldn't believe it because he remembered the day that I was born, and he was holding me, looking at me, thinking, like, how long am I going to be around? Um, how much of her life will I be there for? And I'll just sort of close at a high level, though the war was transformative for him. He was most proud of his 30 years of teaching because, like I said, everywhere we went, people would say, Mr. Tipper, the bank teller, um, you know, someone mowing the lawn, Mr. Tipper, I remember when you did this, he was invited every year to the class reunions and he really transforms, transformed people's lives. Um, I was with him when he died five years ago and we knew it was about 24 hours before he died and we knew that that's what we were headed towards. And I called one of my friends and I said, you know, I don't know what to do. I've never been around someone that's died, let alone my father or someone I'm close to. And she said, don't tell him how much you love him. That's just gonna make him upset. He already knows that, just validate his life. So we sort of talked a little bit about his accomplishments and we talked mostly about his 30 years of teaching and the lives that he touched and transformed. Talked about his service, of course. And without skipping a beat, uh, he said to me, yeah, I do have a pretty good CV, don't I? <laughs> and that was one of the last things my dad said to me. And I remember the night that he died talking about going back to when you all filmed. It was the wettest you know, year in England in 75 years. The night that my father died, it sleeted in Colorado, which really never happens. And it was a dark sky. And I just remember walking outside thinking that the weather matched the mood for me. But when I thought about it afterwards, I thought it's incredible that my father almost died overseas, you know, face down in the mud in some of these like horrific conditions and instead 70 years later after this life where he transformed other lives he was surrounded by the people that loved him most and he got to go out sort of with that validation it made me think of so many of the ones that didn't come home and so many of the family members that didn't get the experience of knowing their fathers of um, seeing their fathers transform the world in the way that someone like my dad did. Even, <clears throat> even though he was justly proud of, of the 30 years after the war, did he talk to you about, did he tell you about his experience? Well, like I said, he was 61 when I was born. So, so for me, I'm, by far the youngest child. I am younger than, not to rub it in, but some of the grandchildren. <laughs> so, so my experience was, was different, right? Because I was, I think, 11 when the book was written and it premiered here in New Orleans, when Jody came and you guys did all the interviews. I think I was 16, I remember, because I, I was like, I could drive to the hotel in Denver and I was so thrilled. By the way, my dad was in charge of the alcohol for that, uh, that reunion, so whoever said it took them 20 years to get over the hangar, <laughs> hangover, my father would have been proud. Um, but I just, I, it's one of those things you grow up not really realizing how special that is. I was the little kid at all these reunions. You know, Gene, everyone was kind of living their own life, right? But I was, of course, tagging along with mom and dad, and. I remember you know, dancing on the dance floor with Garnier and uh, he's thrown a stump up on his crutch and like I didn't think anything of that, that that was sort of strange. Um, and they, you know, speaking of wads of dollar bills, they'd say, see that green bottle and see that, that clear bottle with a yellow label, put about three, you know, 
half and half and, and come back over. And then I'd go up to the hotel room and I'd say, Mom, look how much money I have. You know, $80 in tips from bartending at like six years old. <laughs> Gin and tonics. That's, uh, it's uh, amazing I don't have a problem, actually. <laughs> um, but so the stories that I heard had to be kind of calculated to a level that I could understand. I remember going to the 50th anniversary of D-Day. Um, I would have been around 11 years old, and that was the first time that I understood that there was something really different, right? And it was going to, and it was something that you captured in the documentary, it was going to uh, the cemetery, and I was just with my dad. I, my mother came later on that trip, but it was just me and him. And as you can imagine, we were very close. We were at the cemetery in Normandy, which is such a attention because it's stunning. It is a beautiful place, and it's just cross after cross, or Star of David, and it's perfectly aligned, and crosses as far as you can see. I will never forget it. And I looked at a grave marker, and I realized that that soldier that had died really wasn't that much older than me. He'd probably lied about his age. And I turned to my dad, and we were visiting his best friend, Robert Blouser, who died on D-Day. We were visiting his grave, and it was the first time my dad had been back. And I just turned to him, and I said, you were so lucky. You know, stupid, not really thinking about the consequence of that. And that was um, the first time I saw him cry. I mean, he just lost it, and I thought, the gravity of what this moment is for him and what they have carried. So that was the first time that I really understood. And like so many of the others, he talked about other people, but I always had this hunger to know more about, like, what did my dad do? You know, tell me about him. And like, Luz is the funniest person I ever met. And, you know, the dynamic between Babe and Garnier and what was so incredible for me personally going to the premiere was you all brought them to life. Like we knew who they were, the family members before they were identified, their mannerisms, the way they talked, what they said. And now that they're all gone, like you have preserved that not just for me, but for everyone here, for my daughter who never got to meet my dad. And so the things that my dad couldn't share with me, he could share with Jody, and he could share with Garnier and with Lipton and Winners. And I still reap the benefit, like Meg says, the, the resonance is I get to see that and I'll be able to share that with my daughter. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> So George, tell us about your dad and how did he, how did he talk to you about the war? I mean, that seems it seems to be pretty common that they most dads didn't talk about it. How about your dad? Because obviously he was a very outgoing guy. What was his what was his attitude? Oh yeah, he certainly uh, shared stories with me. I wish I would have been able to capture many of them, but. The essence of the stories, there were funny stories, there were god-awful stories, guys getting killed and, and things like that. So, and I think, I'm not sure exactly why, because my brother was older than I was, uh, but the, like we talked yesterday, you know, my mom and dad brought us to reunions as kids. And so we got a chance to visit with the men. We got a chance to visit with Ed Tipper and Babe and Bill and Gordon and Johnny Martin and Don Malarkey. And I don't know, he maybe just included me in that, but he wouldn't just share stories with people that he knew in town unless they asked him. But it was, it was funny, many years after my, a few years after my dad passed away, I saw my old history teacher. And uh, right out of college, he was working at some defense contractor. And he said, geez, you know, your dad told me all these crazy stories about World War II. And it wasn't until the series came out that it's like, wow, I just thought this guy was crazy. <laughs> but, but actually, the stories that he did tell this guy were true. So he, he did share the stories like some other guys didn't. And there was a lot of dark moments these guys saw. 
And I, I think what they were able to do, and I think we touched on it yesterday, was the reunions were a vital part of it and getting together every year. And I know how important it was. And um, so I was born in 1956, July 24th. Remember that date. Nobody's going to send you a car, George. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I, I get more than I can handle. So July 24th, 1956, I have a picture from the 1956 reunion, which was in Los Angeles, and it was in August. Now, I wasn't there. My mother and father <laughs> left me behind with Aunt Josephine and Uncle Jimmy. And I guess they figured it wasn't that important. I was only four weeks old, you know? And, uh, you know, all I needed was a bottle and an occasional change. So, <laughs> but I was really blessed with hearing the stories, meeting the men, you know, Babe and Bill and Ed Tipper. You know, those were, you know, when my dad passed away, well, was killed, I reached out to all the men, and they filled a huge void that was left behind with my dad's passing, your dad, and the cool things you talk about, your dad, and the, the, the things that they did, the schools, and I went to Ed Tipper's services, and I got a chance to meet all those people who would say, hey, Mr. Tipper this and Mr. Tipper that, and it was really super, and the relationship I had with with Babe was just amazing. And on Sundays, I, I would call Babe on Sunday nights, and he would, he would um, when it got close to 7.30, and I never knew the significance of 7.30, but he said, so is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> Which means you were done. Get off the phone. Yeah, because Trisha was calling at 7.30, <laughs> and he didn't have that call waiting dialing thing there. But, and then the relationship with, with Bill, you know, Bill was just a super guy. My, my mom always used to characterize Bill as gruff. And he might have been appeared to be gruff on the exterior, but he was certainly not gruff on his interior. And we were able, we all were able to see that. What was, thanks for that. Um, so what was it like when you first saw Rick portraying your dad? Well, it was really cool, you know, because Rick had called my mom, and I don't think my mom was much help. Well, no, she was... What she, she just said? She, no, she, was, she told me about... She was actually really honest. It, as, she, as she got to be later yeah, in no, life, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it, but she was like, look, you know, people laughed at him a lot, and I think she, it was kind of like a ther weird therapy session for her. When, when, my memory of it is very clear that she was like, look, there are parts of this man that I know like nobody else knows. And she was kind of okay with letting me know some of those pieces. And um, she goes, but nobody, I've never seen anyone who loves some, but he's loved by everyone. I know him as a husband. And so it's this really kind of, really beautiful, interesting place to, to, to meet George there and then have Bill and Babe and Frank Bracani and Lipton all fill in the gaps of that, about their experience with him. But the first road in was your mom. Yeah, yeah, mom was a riot. And um, <laughs> yeah, she didn't pull any punches. No, she didn't pull any punches. She That's a great punches, way to put it. George. My wife, Susan, will certainly attest to that. <laughs> so, Susan, she never uh, liked you. Well, that brings up an interesting question. <laughs> 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 because you're not only seeing Rick play your dad, but you're seeing Frank and and Mike and, and, and Chris, seeing them play men who you knew in a certain way at a, at a certain age. For sure. Now you're getting a view of them, what they were probably like younger. What was that like? Well, it, you know, it was amazing because I had gone to the set and I think it was August that year. And uh, my wife and I went, Joe Hobbs had uh, kind of took care of us. He just said, George, if you come over on your own steam, we'll take care of you. So we did. We flew over there, checked into a hotel, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we went to the set. And it was really cool for me because these guys were playing guys that I knew, that I grew up around. All the guys that survived in World War II that were in the series, I knew most every one of those guys at different levels. 
So it was really cool for me to that day to go to the set. I don't know if it was cool enough for you oh guys, but really cool. it was really cool for me to meet these guys. And I knew all the guys they playing, whether it was Bill or Babe or Johnny Martin or Walter Gordon or Buck Compton and on and on and on. So, yeah, it was really special for me. And, you know, to meet Ivan there and all the wonderful folks at HBO that took care of us. And um, it's been a glorious ride. Yeah, I guess. You know, I just want to say one thing to, to this. It, it, this feels like the most selfish thing to say. And I, and I, and I, I really, because this project has been so, such, it's been such an honor. It's been such an honor. Um, the, the, but if I could get, ask for one last thing, and, I, and this is the selfish part, I would have loved for his dad to see this show. Yeah. That's the one thing. Oh, I think that's a, I, a, a, a common because, sentiment. Uh, yeah. Um, that, that's... Uh, well, you certainly brought him to life, and that's the really cool thing, is bringing, bringing guys in World War II to life so, people, so we all can understand and look at and appreciate the sacrifices that they made. Frank had said when Babe and Bill came to the set, it was like Lennon and McCartney in Liverpool. But what was it like when you, when you, would, when you met George? In other words, when you, would, when you met, and how did the other guys feel about when you're meeting your the son of of your guy, you didn't get to meet there's, George, there's, but now you're meeting his son. Yeah, what, what's that like? It, it, it's um, you know, you you, you just want to do right by her. I, I I wanted him to love me. <laughs> and you certainly did a great job, <laughs> and you warrant that love. And you know, there's been some close calls. I've almost been on the couch a few times. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how's the house doing? Maybe I'll swing by and yeah. taking that off. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to do right. I mean, we all wanted to do right. I mean, I, I told this story in the first thing, and it was, you know, it's incredibly nerve-wracking. We're, in, we're in Paris, we're about to go do the premiere of the thing, and, and Babe and Bill are sitting at the table with me, and Bill's like, well, here we go, kid, this is it. We're about to go watch the thing. Hope you're funny. <laughs> and, I, and I'm trying to kind of, you know, say something funny. I'm like, yeah, because, you know, funny how that works. <laughs> and Bill's like, because he was funny. <laughs> and I go, yeah, yep, sure, because jokes are the when funny. And Babe goes, oh, forget about it. <laughs> right. They had written me off, so I could only go up from there. So I think that's why I got a lot of grace. Um, yeah, we were under an incredible amount of pressure to, 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 um, to, to do right by everybody. Um, and, I, and, I, and of course, you know, it's like I, I felt this connection to the to the family, we still have that connection. Never, that'll never be broken. But you do sigh a breath of relief when people go, hey, good job, yeah. well done. Yeah, yeah and you did, you did such a great job with my mom, too, at the premiere. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we're at the premiere in Paris, and my wife secured us a wonderful room, and you and your wife came up, and you were always taking care of my mom, her, and she yeah, just I loved, loved it. So. I love being with her. You know, those kinds of things uh, really go a long way. Uh, we, and, and the same thing with Grace, because I was really close with Ron during that Grace period, and we, and I would, we would say, uh, you know, hey, I'll pop by for a beer, and he's like, hey, great, Grace is over. Ron would be like, you know, Grace is, Grace is at the house. And I'd be like, oh, great, well, come to Grace. You know, like, Grace was there all the time. Yeah. They, they, were, they were constantly seeing each other. You have to understand, too, with Grace Nixon, she was about four foot 11. Yeah, she's tiny. <laughs> and she drove a huge Cadillac Eldorado <laughs> that she could barely see over the steering wheel. Yeah. And she lived up on the hill, in the hills of Sherman Oaks, and her driveway was about three S's. <laughs> so, watching her. <laughs> seeing her, seeing her attempt, well, not attempt, she always succeeded yeah. coming down that driveway and she, because she was a big Dodger fan, too. That's she was right. not going to miss a game that she was invited yeah. to. She loved the Dodgers. Everyone thinks that, many people think that the, when the guys came home from World War II, it was all ticker tape parades and the GI Bill, and they just got on with their lives. But, of course, it was more complex than that, and, and we don't get a chance, we didn't get a chance in the series to, to delve into that too much, but you couldn't, you couldn't jump into Normandy. You couldn't uh, hold the line at Bastogne. You couldn't see the things you saw and do some of the things you had to do and not be affected by it. Chris, you were telling me some of the stuff with your dad that 
you know, as we, as, as Bruce was saying in, in the previous panel, your dad had to see, and I mean, your grandfather, I'm sorry, had to, um, had, had, had to see, he had to take care of everybody. He went from wound to wound to worse wound to dead. So that had an effect on him. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so, you know, if I'd have known something were going to show up, I'd have done something with my hair, but... Um, <laughs> because my grandfather died before the series came out and because I was a dumb college student when the book came out and didn't care about my, my mom, my mom, um, on, on 1992 when I was a sophomore or junior in college and I came home a weekend to get my clothes washed and mom's cooking and she handed me the book and she goes, your grandfather jumped on D-Day. Well, that didn't sound like beer or girls to me at all. So <laughs> what does that have to do with me? And so... I didn't know what I didn't know. And, and so the series came out. Of course, we learned about the series. And to your point, there's, there's, we walked through yesterday through the European section, and there's a, a quote you know, on the wall, and it says, no man goes to combat and comes back normal. And that gave me goosebumps. And um, so everyone sees Shane Taylor, and Shane Taylor is Doc Rowe. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I love Shane Taylor. Um, and I love what he gave me as my grandfather, who I didn't know in this regard. But my grandfather drank after the war. And that, I don't, I'm not embarrassed about that in the smallest sense. Um, several of Easy Company guys drank after the war. Roe was the only medic in Easy Company to go from D-Day to Hitler's Eagle's Nest. So if you were wounded in Easy Company, or if you died in Easy Company, my grandfather had his hands on him. So there's no way my grandfather came back normal. And, and, then, and people talk about PTSD, and without knowing the questions, I don't, I don't have the answers. But my mom said something a few years ago. And she's, my grandfather met my grandmother. She was uh, working on the southern coast of England. So he met her and followed her home, which would be stalking today. Um, I like to think of it as an aggressive pursuit of your goals. <laughs> That's how I tell the cops. <laughs> um, so she was a British war bride, and he stood her up on D-Day. They were to be married on June 6th. And obviously he came back and married her afterward. And my mom said, the man that my mother met is not the man she married. And it clicked. No man goes to war and comes back normal. No medic serves in the entire war and treats those men and sees those bodies and is normal. And so I love what Shane did and I love what every writer and producer and director did to show the heroism of my grandfather. Because he's my hero too. I'm a fan. Rose, my hero. But these men were human beings after the war, and the war was not 10 episodes. And those guys, Winters, and all of them said, every day I thought about those men. And so from my grandfather, and I told y'all not to make me cry, um, from my grandfather it was different because he never shot, he never fought, but he spent his time holding those men and taking care of those men. And I, he was never normal, but he did his job. Well, it's almost like he absorbed, you know, with what he had to do, he had to absorb so many wounds, and there's only so many wounds you can absorb. Yeah. Shane, you didn't get a chance to meet Doc Rowe, but you, you knew what he did. You knew what he had to do, not just at Bastogne, but as Chris was telling us from June 6th, all the way to, to into May, May 8th. You didn't get a chance to meet him, you knew what he did. How did that inform how you portrayed him, in, particularly in episode six? Well, I think, uh, you know, Ralph Spina came in pretty handy for me. And I, I mean, I often think about if I had had the same situation as Frank and, and Robin and Rick and some others, you know, and thinking, well, 
that would have been interesting. How would that have shaped my approach? And then I realized that, well, you know, I'm not sure because of what he went through and what you've said and the fact that he didn't really talk, I'm not sure I would have got anywhere anyway. So I had what I had. And, and as you know, the, the production provided materials. I had numbers to call. Uh, and Ralph was pretty significant in terms of the role of a medic of the period. And um, along with, the, again, coming back to the cadre with what they knew, uh, the script, which I really invested a lot into that script. I mean, I just, it, things were just there for me. And there was something about it that I, I don't know, I was just, I, I was just imagining the way I was gonna approach it as I was reading this stuff. And, you know, with the help of the rest of the fellas, it, 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 was, all, it was all there. As I was saying earlier, the conditions to do that kind of role in this kind of series, it was just there to, to just go for it, uh, commit, not question it, and not be, you know, they, we were so well protected from the outside. It was, it was just all there. So, you know, I, I, I just, all that was there that I had is all I had, but it was, it was, it was a lot and enough to go on. Um, and so, you know, our journey doesn't start until after the, the show. And Marlene, one of Eugene's daughters, and her sister Maxine, who I haven't had a, a great hug in the history of my life. <laughs> and I had that in Paris. And then this guy, we've just been the best of friends ever since. And you talk about a legacy, you talk about something that honors the kind of people like George here in the front row. That's one kind of legacy that we've been able to do. But the other thing is this. I mean, this is phenomenal. Mm. This is untouchable. Mm. And this, can, this will continue. Right. You know. Jody, as I mentioned earlier, in some ways, you got to know Babe and Bill, as opposed to Robin and Frank, et cetera, et cetera. You got to know so many of the men. Tell us about that experience, because you, as you said, over three years, you met almost every living member of Easy Company. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a, as we've heard, it was a life-changing experience, for sure. Um, and I did get to meet the men in a different way than other people, because... I was the only woman on the uh, documentary team, maybe on Band of Brothers, I don't know. I mean, that's that part of it. And um, the first trip that we took was, as everyone said, we had to audition for winters. So we decided to go to um, Pennsylvania. And the first stop was to meet Babe and Bill. And, um, we walked in, it was one of the hottest days of the summer. We were in South Philly in, in you know, Bill's Row House. And we were greeted by these two gentlemen who were already very well oiled, as they used to say. <laughs> and it was nine o'clock in the morning. So we all, you know, my partners and I looked at each other and we're like, we better get, get to this quickly. Um, and it was, as I said, it, it felt like it was about 120 degrees because we had to turn off the air conditioner because it was so loud that you couldn't hear the audio. Um, so to keep the recording pristine, we had to, we were all sweating. We talked to them both for several hours and then we went outside to take some portraits. And Mark was um, with Will, they were setting up the shot that they wanted and I was standing with Babe and Bill and they turned to each other with this look in their eye and um, Babe says to Bill should we tell her about the 101 and I was like what do you mean he, and so Bill goes well you you know what the 101 is right I'm like yeah it's the 101st Airborne Division I know that and they're like no and so then I knew I was in trouble and what happened next was I was suddenly caught up in Garnier's arms, which, like, he had one leg, but somehow he was the most fleet-footed yeah. 
<laughs> guy. And they, b Babe gave me a kiss on this cheek. Then b Bill suddenly was in the crook of his arm, being tipped backwards, upside down, and he planted a French kiss on my mouth. <laughs> that was the O. So it's one Thank, o. thank you, Mom. <laughs> one. So I, I learned how the 101, you know, <laughs> made it through the war. It was, it was then, always VE day with those two. <laughs> I know, it was always VE. But the, the funny part was we then, we then interviewed um, Major Winters, which was extraordinary. And then we came back to Santa Monica to show the, what, the footage to um, Tom Hanks and, and to you at, at Playtone. And so these were the first images that anybody had seen of the guys. And we put up, um, we put your father's photo up there and it was on the big screen and Tom Hanks goes, oh my, look at all the character in his face. And, and I couldn't help it, I just said, yeah, it's a great, he's like, what a great face. And I said, yeah, it's great until it's right on top of you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, this is, I have to say, the best moment in my, my Hollywood career was Tom Hanks was laughing so hard, he was tipping back in his chair and he actually fell off his chair. <laughs> Well, tell you, you mentioned, and you got to know uh, Richard Winters pretty, pretty well. And y you and I have talked a lot about Dick over in the last couple of days. You had a particular story of how, you were saying how observant Dick was and how we benefited, the production benefited, Eric Jenderson benefited because he kept so meticulous records. And he was always paying attention. T talk about how important that was. Yeah, so I was, I've noticed this because lately I've been working with first responders and what I've noticed about police officers is how they're hyper vigilant. And it made me think about when I was around Major Winters because he had that same quality of, of a law enforcement officer and he was always watching everyone all the time. He always knew what was happening everywhere all the time. Um, and just a funny story about that was when we were, another time we flew out to interview him at his farm in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And Ethel, his wife, had made this extraordinary spread of, for lunch. And it was set up in the barn because it was a, a really windy day. And um, I made my sandwich. Uh, and Ethel was standing there watching me. And I could tell that like she had picked everything that she from her own garden, you know, and had grown the lettuce. And so I tried to pile it all on my sandwich, the tomato. And I was, it just kept getting bigger and bigger, my sandwich, because I wanted her to know that I appreciated, you know, her efforts. And I take it out to the picnic table in the yard, and we're all sitting there, and I suddenly realized that there's, I forgot to cut my, my sandwich in half, and there, it's so big <laughs> that it's not gonna actually fit into my mouth without spilling everywhere. And I'm just having this moment about what to do about that, when suddenly, poof, and I look up, and Major Winters was standing there with his jump knife in his hand, and he had sliced my sandwich in half, and perfectly. And then he just sort of like wiped the blade off on his shoulder and stuck it back into his jump boots and walked away. And he never said one word, but he was watching. He saw that I was such an idiot. I made my sandwich too big, couldn't eat it, and he fixed the problem. Wow. But he never kissed you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us um, of the moments, because again, you, you interviewed and were eat and in the interviews of so many of the men. Or anything, any any particular interviews stand out, or any any particular sentiments that were expressed, either that became, were common or that were unique and therefore stood out. Oh gosh, well it, it has to do with what um, Chris was saying, which was it was really difficult to get them to talk about after the war, you know, um, if they had any. PTSD or, or challenges readjusting to life, and that was something that we were all curious about. And the only, the only person who really opened up about that was Malarkey. And I remember distinctly, he just, out of all the guys, really 
wore his heart on his sleeve. And I could tell when I started asking him about what he did after the war, and for all those the guys who knew him, like, you know, remember how his eyes would just well up with tears, like at the drop of a hat? He started doing that and, and he said that, um, he didn't want to talk about it, but then he did. And he said he went to college on the GI Bill, but he had to drop out his freshman year because he just, he couldn't, he just couldn't sit there and be in school. He, he had too much um, anxiety and memories. I remember, um, we've talked about the Denver reunion uh, a lot this morning, and I uh, flew, I came to that as well. And I remember landing at the airport in Denver, and I called Mark Cowan, who was the director. And I got Mark on the phone, and the first thing he said to me was, get ready. Because, and the point is what I was about to walk into experience that I had never, he was sure I had never had before because you guys had just been experiencing it for the last few weeks. Tell us, you know, tell you and Mark and, and Will and John Campbell and, and Steve Wax, which was the documentary crew, when did you know you had something special? When, when did that, when did you start, when did it start sinking in that this was just not another gig? Oh, on, on day one when I was sitting um, on the steps of Garnier's house, sweating to death, and Babe was, he came over and he started singing. He was <laughs> Bridget O'Flynn. Yeah, he started singing Bridget O'Flynn and, and Where Have You Been? And that was a song Joe Toy liked, you know. Yeah. And I said to Mark, we need to record him singing this song because it would be so cool if we could figure out how to put it in the documentary. And of course, we, it ends up being when the credits roll, it's Babe, babe singing that song. Um, and that was when we knew, like we just knew from the, the moment that we walked in the door that this was going to be amazing, amazing experience. And it's so humbling to know that I, we all had that opportunity to, to be firsthand talking to, to these guys. And just so, and, and really, what was the process? I mean, I know you went to a bunch of, a, a lot of men's homes, but also you guys came to the Denver reunion and also to the reunion right here in New Orleans in 2001 at the Hotel Monteleone. Talk about, you, you said a little bit about it yesterday, how you had A room and B room and you were shuttling back and forth and, and, and these guys were lining up, um, you know, figuratively, to tell their stories. They had been so reluctant to tell their stories, but now, now they were for what you tell us why now they're lining up to tell their stories. Yeah, I think they, they realized, well, when we, when we, after we came back from Pennsylvania, we then went out on the road. And as I said yesterday, um, unfortunately, the first person that we were scheduled to interview passed away as we were driving the van to his house. And um, so we had to call immediately and just say, we need to hurry this up you know, and try to capture these stories because if you don't talk to the person before they go, you're never gonna you're never gonna get the whole history. So um, we went to uh, Popeye Wynn, we went to Carwood Lipton. This is all on the second trip. Then we went from Lipton's house to Shifty Powers, and every time we would go into somebody's living room, it wasn't just um, the veteran, it would be his whole family, his wife, his kids, his grandchildren. And they were all coming because in most cases, they had never, ever, ever spoken about what happened in the war. Um, so it was really special that way. But when we would go to the conventions, we would rent uh, suites, and then we would bring them in on the hour one after the other. So once the, the the guys at the reunion started hearing that we, you know, that Tom Hanks's team had come, they all wanted a chance to talk. So it was pretty easy. Yeah. I'll never forget um, when you guys. It was you were still on that first road trip, and Mark Cowan called me from the road, and he said, you know, every it's funny because when we pull up to a, a house of whomever it would be, 
there would be not just an extended family, but sometimes maybe a neighbor or a best friend. Or, and Mark said, you know, I thought, and eh, they think Tom Hanks is going to, or Steven Spielberg is going to be here, or it's just lights, camera, action, and it's the, some kind of the glamour of Hollywood. But he concluded very quickly, of course, that had nothing to do with any of that that this is the first time grandpa's ever told these stories. So everybody wants to hear, everybody wants to gather around that campfire. I think also they, they had a sense of their, of the, they finally had a sense of what they had contributed to history. And it was really important for them to share it with, with all of us so that we would not necessarily remember what they as individuals had done, but but the war itself and why this museum exists, they wanted to um, make sure that the world knew that this could never happen again. Tell, tell the audience um, what role Major Winters played, not only in his interview, but in helping secure so many of the other interviews. Yeah, so once we got the blessing from Major Winters, which was amazing, um, he would call whoever we were gonna go talk to, and we didn't even know this was happening, but I guess he would call them and say, Mark and Will and Jody and Steve Wax, and sometimes John Campbell, are coming, and you know, you, you can tell them what happened. We want you to, to share your story. Yeah, he's, he, he was being company commander even then, giving them direction. Absolutely, but I would have to say that Babe and Bill were sort of in charge of all the reunions. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about the reunions because I, I think I went to three or four of them, but certainly Denver and New Orleans. And by that point, the, the series had been announced, but we hadn't shot anything yet. But talk about the reunions, all you, all the, the kids, because I was struck, I think, and, and again, I think that's part of what Mark was saying to me, you know, wow, watch out, you're gonna step into something you haven't seen before, which was essentially about a 300 person family reunion. And it wasn't just the guys, it was not just a reunion of Easy Company, it was, it was a reunion of George and Chris and, and, and Gene and, and, and Trisha and everyone. So talk, the kids, tell us what those reunions were like growing up, I mean, and, and getting to know not just the, the, your father's comrades, but your cousins. I think George is this one to speak. He was the only person they couldn't leave home. Like we didn't go to any reunions. Most of us, correct, George? Yeah, you exactly. Went. There wasn't a lot of kids at the reunions early. Yeah, we didn't go. And uh, I read this kind of a humor story. My second reunion was in Las Vegas in 1968. And I, I was 12 years old. We were staying at the Stardust Hotel, and my father would give me $5 a day to eat. And in Vegas, in 1968, you could eat breakfast for 99 cents, lunch for $1.99, and dinner for $2.99. Child so, abuse, child abuse, George. What's that? It was child abuse. You, you had to oh, leave okay. your home. <laughs> so so I, I clued into this kiosk anyway. So I think I ate at Nestle's, Crick, uh, Nestle's Crunch Bar they had. But one of the nights, it was the final night, and it was the final dinner. Colonel Sink was there. My dad, I got a cool picture of my dad, Colonel Sink. Well, the Rainy girls were there. My sister was there. She was 16. All I remember was somehow we got off the strip into some nightclub. I'm 12 years old. <laughs> we're in some nightclub. It's loud as can, you know, when you're 12 years old, it's loud. There's a lot of loud music, and, and I wasn't into loud music, so I, I said to myself, how in the world did I get here? So, you know, but anyway, that was one of my early uh, memories of the reunion. When, when, did you, when did you start coming to reunions as, as adults? Because I, I don't remember ever not going. Um, you know, like I said, it was a little bit different because... Um, I didn't know it was abnormal not to have 40 sets of grandparents that transformed the face of the world. You know, it just, um, and there, it was a family, but in a way I was like the little rug rat running around all the time while everyone else's lives were sort of taking off. Um, so what I will say is I ultimately ended up going into politics after my dad died and in, in part um, inspired 
because of his life, but also his death. And when I reflect on it, you know, these men, like these actors, were from all over the country. I know the actors are from, you know, different countries, but different backgrounds, different, you know, religions, different philosophies, different ways to problem solve or confront each other. And they didn't always get along. They sometimes disagreed, but they were so connected and would have done anything for each other. And I think it was an early lesson for me in how you can have people from very different backgrounds coalesce around either an experience or a commitment and that the greater good, right, um, mattered more than any one difference. And so in some ways, I think that shaped my career a lot is seeing how these guys were able to just be best of friends despite any differences that they actually had. One of the things you said was you had 40 sets of mm -hmm. grandparents. One of the things that struck me, and, and Jody, maybe you can comment on too, is that you'd go to a reunion and you realize everybody kind of knew everybody else's business, and I mean that in a good way. You knew where, who was not doing, whose kids wasn't doing well in school, and I don't mean obviously the men, but the, but the succeeding generations, and who, who had just had an operation, and who had just gotten married, and, and this is over, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of families. I'll add one of the reasons, um, you know, Bill and Babe were really responsible for the reunions, but they were, there was such a sincere connection and that they wrote letters to each other all the time. And so after my dad died, going through his office was one of the more emotional moments of my life to read letters from Winters, letters from Lipton, talking about, or letters, copies that my dad would type, or I think he would either keep a copy or, or maybe even Lipton's family or Winters family sent us copies of the letters he had sent. And it was like a diary. I read about my dad telling the guys that he'd met my mom and that he was gonna get married and that, he didn't know what he had been missing out on, and that he didn't realize that he wanted a partner to share his life with. I mean, really intimate stories. And they all shared that. There was a newsletter that they had, and you know, they would tease each other and riff, and there was, I think what, what also stuck with me is the reunions were all laughter, right? It was just everyone busting each other's balls all the time. <laughs> Like, and like, like they'd spend a year planning practical jokes and like what, what they were gonna do. And so I think that was their therapy, right? It's like to be able to get together and have those moments of levity with the people that, the only other people in your world that know what you felt. And it's funny you, you say that because of the three reunions I went to and I spent a lot of time and I don't, I re, I don't recall them ever they would talk about the war, but they would talk about the funny parts of the war. Do you remember this? Do you remember when he, f he fell over? Do you remember that joke? There was only one time that I remember, and it was here in New Orleans, uh, that I remember, and it was with your dad, and it was with your dad, and it was with John Martin. And we were at the Carousel Bar at the Hotel Monteleone. And I guess it was about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, so they were well oiled, oiled. <laughs> which was fine, and I was just honored that they allowed, there was nobody else at the bar, and I was honored that they allowed me to be part of it. And they talked about D-Day, and they talked about operationally about D-Day, not in any detail, not any tactical, sophisticated tactical sense, but just reminiscing. But I know that was the exception. I know that normally when they got together, they got together for the laughter and the love. Um, when. As, a, as the children, Trish, again, because your dad and Jean, because your dad were so instrumental at, the, at these reunions, why did they do that? Why, why did they do it year after year? Well, for me, I think, and George, you could tell me if I'm lying, but I think my dad ran most of the reunions, correct, George? He kept the company together. He knew Joe Toy's address, he knew Joe Toy's phone number, zip code, like Frank said before. He was, but you know what, that's never impacted anything in our house. I got a phone call one time. I'll tell you a real quick story about a phone call. It's from Johnny Martin. A lot of my father's friends had money. I mean, real kind of money, the kind of money you'd run away from home with. 
And my mother always used to tell me, you know, kid, you should marry one of them Gordon girls or Johnny Martin's daughter. <laughs> because I said, how do I want to do that? They said, they got money. <laughs> anyway. anyway, I couldn't afford to get to their house, and that's why that fell through. <laughs> but anyway, my father goes in the hospital. I'll tell you a real quick joke, and then I'll tell you, I'll tell you this other story that's very funny. My father goes into the hospital. He's, getting, he's wearing a wooden leg. This wooden leg, God's honest truth, it's made of maple. It, it weighs about 30 pounds. I'm being, it just bent at the knee. It didn't bend at the foot. And when my father was injured, and you could see Frank's leg grew back. Nice job. When my father was injured, he was injured below the knee. And in Bastoon sometime, my father told me they cut it off with a saw. It's probably true. I don't know that for a first sake. But when he came home, he had gangrene, and they cut it above his knee. So he had a wooden leg, this maple wooden leg. And this is, I'm going to preface this story with this leg. He put this wooden leg on every day and went to work like nothing happened. And what boggles my mind today when I tell you this story, when people have prosthetics and legs and there's straps, there's springs, there's all kinds of stuff. He had a wooden leg. When he put it on, it was a stump sock. Stump sock went over his leg and came out of valve. And he would put the leg on, pull the stump sock out and tighten the valve. Now, this didn't mean anything to me when I was little. This leg was held on by vac like, like vacuum, you know, when you pull a suction. So in the old days, this is the story I'm going to tell you. In the old days, before cable TV and everything, there was antennas on the roof. You said he had a row house in South Philly. On the roof, on the chimney, was an antenna. So the way you set your TV up downstairs is you had to turn the antenna around to get it where it goes. Now, my uncle, Muscles Marinara, is downstairs at the TV. My brother and I are on the bed, and my father is up on the roof, climbing up on the roof with this wooden leg. He would go everywhere. With it. He climbs on the roof. My brother and I were the in-between. Well, how's that? He's turning a little bit more. He turns. He finally gets it the way he wants it. My father tightens it up, and he's coming down. He hangs off the roof, and this is the God's honest truth. His leg falls off, the suction. But wait a minute. It doesn't come out of his pants. So his leg's about eight, nine feet long, <laughs> hanging out of his pants. He's, he's laughing. He's holding onto the roof because if he knows if he jumps, he's going to be a soprano. <laughs> so we hollered downstairs, Mom, Daddy's leg fell off. We didn't, you know, we didn't. And then Muscles Marinara comes off and helps him down. And it, it, after that, I'm, as I got older, I thought, how come my uncle, who really was, how come he was on the roof and my father? <laughs> But that's a, that's a funny story. And talking about your dad and Babe real quick, to tell you what, how much Tom Hanks liked them. Babe and my father, if you, you can see this on YouTube, they, this even, when I say this, it's going to sound crazy. They were invited to the AFI as surprise guests for Tom Hanks. I'm thinking, oh, are you sure that you're, this is the right number? So they go, and they come out, and it's on YouTube. Babe, my father comes out on crutches, and your father comes out on a walker. And then they, you know, they make a speech. But Tom Hanks loved them, and they loved him. In fact, when Tom Hanks was in England, when they left, they were on episode five, they were there with the guys and all. When my father came home, he sent gifts to Tom Hanks. I said, I don't think Tom Hanks needs, oh, kid, you gotta send, you know, you gotta send him gifts. I'm sure he needs a cheesesteak or something. <laughs> anyway, that's one of the stories. I mean, I got a couple of stories, but my father was, let me tell you the French, the French guy that came over his house. Go real please quick. Do. His, now my father, my mother died in 1997, so my father was living alone in this row house. He never locked the door. People, he had his phone number and address in the phone book. Now it's like if I could look up any actor's phone name and phone number in the, in the book, people would be visiting them, right? So I, if I changed his phone number, which I could, if I took it out of the phone book, I would have had to move out of the country. I would have been in Israel now, something like that. So he had people visit him all the time. And anyway, this French, the French ambassador to the United States comes over his house and is going to give him this, I don't know what the hell it's called, it's like the silver, what is it? Legion of Honor. Thank you very much. So he's going to give him the Legion of Honor. So he, my, he comes over, He's got police with him, the security, they all come in his house, they're real. And plus my father had 20 Navy SEALs with him, that's another story. So when he gets this medal, the guy leaves, and my friend goes over, Ronnie, to visit him. But a lot of people would visit him, see if he needed something, and so on and so forth. And he says, Ronnie, look at this thing, the French, you missed, missed the French guy come over. 
And Ronnie looks at the mace. Oh, Bill, this is beautiful. He says, what is this? He said, I had a frig the wine, though. They brought it over here. So Ronnie says, and he told him what it was. And he says, what did you say to the guy? And I'm not going to, he said, I told him it's about effing time. You know, I should have told the French ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> That's dealing with him and Babe was a real experience. Anyway, Trish, I divert to you. <laughs> Follow that. Um, but Tri Thanks, Gene. <laughs> I have a feeling this has happened before. Um, but, but, but the serious question is, why did your dad, he really threw himself into, into organizing. I, I mean, I think I know why, but why do you think he threw himself in, put, spent so much time and effort in organizing the reunions. Well, I think um, Uncle, my Uncle Bill did most of it. He, would, he really, the men really respected him and wanted to spend, they, they all wanted to get together because they just loved each other so much. Like Carrie said, they really loved each other. And my dad was very close to um, Buck Compton, Don Malarkey, and it was a way for them to see each other once a year, which I understand now is very unusual. Most army regiments don't get together once a year. Um, but it was just a way for them to spend time with each other. They understood each other because they couldn't talk to us about their experiences. They could only talk to each other. I said yesterday in one of the panels that I would ask, inevitably I would ask the cliche question, why didn't you talk about it? And I got two common answers. One was if, why would I tell my wife, my children, my grandchildren, anyone I cared about, about the worst things I've ever seen and on occasion had to do. But the other thing that was maybe even more common was the answer I would receive is, if you weren't there, you couldn't understand. And I think, I think it's pretty obvious that that's what the reunions were. They did need to talk, they did want to talk. They didn't necessarily want to talk about D-Day or freezing in Bastogne, but they definitely wanted to talk, but they could really only talk to each other. And then finally, as we're gonna wrap up, um, this, this panel is about the legacy of Easy Company, but I'd like to know from Frank and, and, and Robin and you guys, what is the personal legacy of portraying Bill Garnier? Babe Heffron, Doc Rowe, George Laws. Can you just tell us your, the personal legacy of, of portraying these men? Um, for, for me, it, it, he, he made me a better man. Knowing both of them, Bill and Babe, because they were a real, they were a team, so it was, but, but Bill made me a better man, made me a better father. I think he made me a better citizen. Uh, made me a better friend. They, they had the friend game on such a high level. The bar was set so high um, that that's what you aim for. I think anybody who met them, that's, that's your model about my best friends in my life is to try to have a piece of what they had. Um, he made me better in, in all those ways. Um, and, and the last thing he really gave me, especially as I get older, was he gave me the blueprint to how to get old, and what aging could be like, how much fun you can have, how much passion you can have, how fearless you can be um, getting older. Um, he, was, he was so virile late in life. Like I used to look at them and go, what the hell was this guy like at 19? What the hell was his testosterone levels at 19? Because he was so much man late in life. I mean, you, you, well, that's for sure. Jody, they, she, Jody knows the hard way. Uh, Just a side note, Frank, my dad was in love with Jody. <laughs> he would call me to talk to Jody today. <laughs> and I just found out like an hour ago that he used to call her and sing to her on her answering machine. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> wow. How yeah, I, I remember the first time it happened, I, I had taken a run on the beach and I came back to my apartment in Santa Monica. And you know, this is before internet and before cell phones. And I had a, an answering machine with tape in it. And I pressed, you know, and suddenly uh, Babe's voice was singing. I can't even do this. Bridget O'Flynn, where have you been? <laughs> and I, it was just, you know, wow. yeah. yeah, they were great. And they, they sent me, so, your dad 
sent stuff all the time. My they father, they would go shopping or something, and I would just open my mailbox, and there would be like a compact that the women carried in the 40s with a mirror, <laughs> with a little note inside. Got them in the just garage. Just thinking show. about you. <laughs> One dollar, I'll take all that. <laughs> yeah, but the was thing it, that I that I got that um, I treasure most is they made me an honorary member of Easy Company, and they framed it and they signed it, oh. and I have it on my office wall, and it, I look at it every day. Robin, what uh, what was the leg legacy of portraying your personal legacy of portraying Babe Heffron? I, I think I echo what Frank said. You. you Spend time with Babe and Bill, and yeah, you think oh, that's that's something to aspire to, to be, to have that sort of joie de vivre, you know. But my personal legacy is, you know, now that Babe has gone, is my friendship with Trisha. You know, we're we're just really good friends, you know, and that's. A, a wonderful thing, you know. All the guys are my, you know, close, dear friends. But, you know, this is, this is really special, you know. Yes, Shane. Well, oh yeah, there you go. Well, we've touched on this before, you know, the idea of just how it's funny, you know, because the way Bill was that adhesive element to the reunions, and this guy here in the waistcoat along with Mike, but this guy was, was our man. Yeah. And it's uncanny. I mean, his ability, a natural ability, to be able to bring everybody together. Um, he, he, he was the soldier soldier for us. Hmm. And um, I, I love him to bits, I don't see him enough, but I really appreciate what he's done for us. Um, my own personal legacy, well, this man and the family. You know, I've shared, I've been to Louisiana, I've shared king cake. <laughs> the, they look after you here, and um, uh, and this is so special. It's so it's so special. Um, I'm so very grateful for everything that, that the show has done, and um, you know, I can't talk highly of of the family, and uh, and I'll cherish that forever. Rick, you're it feels like you, you, you were going to go in circles, but it's the exact same thing. It's that you have your, your family, and then you are embraced by all these other families, and then we have each other. Mike said it beautifully yesterday when he said, you know, my son just says moonshot. That really was awesome, Mike. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just a moonshot. <laughs> um, there's, there's, it's, it's almost all magic. I don't know how to describe it. Right. Um, Anyway, thank you guys for uh, another <laughs> one, one, one last thing. If you, if, one last point. If you um, when you go to if you're in London, and you go down to, in the basement of St Paul's Cathedral. There's Christopher Wren's tomb. Christopher Wren's the greatest architect in British history, designed the St Paul's. And there's a quote on the wall, and it says, "If you seek his legacy." look around. Well, if you seek their legacy, look around. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Kirk, uh, Jody, family cast members, that was uh, another tour de force, a uh, very powerful session. And uh, you're fine. You, you guys are kings. You can do what you want. The, uh, just a, a, a couple quick notes. Uh, I should note, uh, Echo Company during the war uh, sustained 150% casualties, killed, wounded, missing in the war, to kind of put in, in context uh, what, what they're talking about here today. If you think of that uh, incredible piece. And, you know, seeing now the actors have become really adopted members of the, their characters' families, uh, super remarkable as, as they're part of this. Uh, larger piece going on and you know it's it, it seems safe to say that you know we've all witnessed here that the with the panelists the cast the crew the members everybody in attendance really the legacy of of easy company but really the legacy of the american experience in world war ii is in good hands and we're certainly inspired uh and your words certainly inspired me to, to try to be a better fill in the blank 
you know, dad, citizen, historian maybe. Uh, but uh, we're almost to a break, and pretty soon you'll say it's about effing time we had a break, right? But, uh, you know, got to just check real quick. And so we had a show of hands before about who was enjoying the conference. I think everybody's good, right? All right. Are you guys okay? Quick poll. You know, who's been to our international conference? The one we have in November. Okay. Perfect. That, uh, and then for those who haven't yet signed up for the conference, uh, we've got the, you can visit the Travel and Conference web, uh, table. We've got an, a cool flyer for that. Uh, and we're going to feature uh, resistance to occupation the first day, and then we'll have two more days of pretty amazing sessions. I was asked before about, you know, Masters of the Air. Will there be a panel on that? Uh, amen. Yes, you'll see that. Uh, but if you, if you uh, book today for November, you get a $100 discount off the conference and $50 off the pre-conference symposium. So there's my plug. Uh, hope you do it because it's going to be uh, an amazing experience uh, Certainly, we've learned a lot about the Band of Brothers uh, today. We've got one more session. Uh, but, you know, it's certainly important for us to remember that the American experience in the war is more than just one company, one battalion, one regiment, a single division. Uh, there's 16 million other Americans who serve around the world that also do these incredibly amazing things. So uh, just uh, it's amazingly inspiring, but also, it, for me, it's important to remember that uh, in many ways, as unique as they are, they also are uh, very symbolic of the experience of so many other Americans. So with that, we're going to take a break. I'll see you at uh, 1500 at 3 o'clock as we go into the next session of the day. Thank you again. <laughs>